Hello and welcome to this, the second session of our symposium. I'm Dr. Stephen Proud from the University of Bristol and with me is Dr. Ralph Becker from the University of Manchester. Hello. So what challenges are you facing right now with online delivery of econometric material? Uh, hi, Steve. I think actually there are quite a lot of challenges and uh, you may be able and uh, everyone watching that to think of more. But but here are the, th the four, I think, uh, are predominant on my mind. Firstly, how do I deliver content online um, without having to rely on fully prepared slides? Because what I don't want is just PowerPoints uh, online. So in some sense, in my mind, I'm thinking of how am I replacing what used to be done in lectures? The second issue we are facing is that we have to re rethink what we do in smaller classes, tutorial or exercise classes, however you label them. And in the, the new world, where we, if we do face to face, we may do fewer, have to do fewer classes in larger rooms, but with smaller numbers of students, we, we may have to rethink what we do in these classes. The third issue we're facing is how we help our students to develop um, econometric or statistical coding skills, uh, again, with even none or fewer on campus computer labs. And the, the last thing that's sort of an overarching thing I'm sort of worried about is how we manage to motivate our students uh, to engage actively with econometrics. I think it used to be that we did a lot of that in lectures and um, with fewer online contact, uh, fewer face to face contact. I'm a little bit worried about how we achieve that. OK. So in this online resource, we hope to be able to deliver some help with these and um, pr hopefully provide some ideas about all of these issues. But let's begin with a quick chat about some of the four issues. Mm. Actually, Steve, can, can I perhaps kick that off with, by asking you how, how important do you think is it to be able to provide handwritten algebra either in asynchronous or in live sessions? Or is that really an anachronistic way of thinking about how to teach stats and econometrics? So I, I don't think it's anachronistic or old fashioned at all. Um, students tell us that they prefer seeing um, problems being solved step by step. And even if you prepare um, PowerPoint slides with each of the steps of the solution um, gone through, students still tell us that they prefer seeing it solved by hand. Now, there are lots of ways that we can go about doing this, and there are a number of ways um, in this um, session that are set out. You could use a high-tech solution like an iPad integrated with a PC. You could use a lower-tech solution like uh, just simply mounting a camera and videoing yourself writing on a piece of paper. But it is important that students see the, um, the problems being solved and seeing the problem developing and that helps them with their learning. See, understanding why you're taking the steps that you're, go, that you're, you, you're taking. Taking the time to be able to um, work through it allows students the time to be able to reflect on why you're doing what you're doing and how it's helping them. Now, Ralph, if you had to rethink your smaller classes, because in smaller classes we're going to end up doing a lot of these kind of problem solving um, exercises, Students, if students have fewer of these, how do you think you might go about doing this? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Currently, lots of our small classes have significant significant elements of these solved solutions, solved problems, and as you just said, I think we actually do have the technology to to record these quite well um, before actually going into a live session. So I, I think doing these, I will possibly do less of these in tutorials because while it was nice to have a teacher there live in the same place at the same time as a student, um, I think it wasn't actually essential to getting good learning outcomes from those. We can do really good recordings. The type of problems I would focus on in live classes with a small number of rooms are the ones which challenge the student's understanding of the material and can only really be addressed fully in a conversation between the teacher and students. 
and perhaps also question questions which directly apply techniques which are covered in the course to topical and relevant problems. In such questions, students and teachers together can usually arrive at a much more satisfying learning outcome than uh, if it's done asynchronously. And that ties in nicely with uh, some of the literature on flipping, which um, indicates that if you move some of the easier foundational material outside of the face-to-face -face, um, exercises or face-to-face -face sessions, you can obviously have a more meaningful conversation and provide support when students need to address the more difficult material. Uh, that's absolutely right. And I think it will challenge us as a teacher to to make sure that we are not satisfied to only teach techniques. Right? We, we need to uh, to understand and make our students understand that we teach, teach techniques for purpose and that purpose has to be in the end their application to some empirical problem. Okay, so Ralph, I know that you've been using R for a while now in your teaching and you tell me that you feel students are engaging well with that software. What have you learned about how, how to help students with their coding skills? Well, I think motivation is absolute key here. If you can't motivate your students to learn a software, in our case it's R, but it could be any other, then you're really uh, on. Uh, you really lost the battle already. So that that is really key. Increasingly, that motivation becomes easier as students understand more and more that having that skill is really valuable in the job market, and you may have to spend some time with that, perhaps even use your career service to reinforce that message. Then the next thing is that you really have to pose interesting problems. You can't just stick to the same textbook examples again and again, and perhaps even artificial examples. You really need to expose your students to interesting real life examples. And lastly, and I think that is absolutely key, is you cannot be happy to just give your students the the right code, the right solutions to a problem. Because if you then send your students off to do their own thing, they will encounter all sorts of hurdles which they need to jump. They may see error messages. They may want to do something which you haven't been teaching them how to do it exactly. And you need to prepare students for that. So you have to tell them how to deal with error messages, how to search for solutions. And that makes the whole learning of coding a much more messy exercise, but a much more realistic exercise that exposes students and prepares students for life after class contact. And that messiness is very much about how students learn. Um, life isn't nice and tidy. And if all solutions are just presented as uh, a fait accompli, um, obviously students don't necessarily learn how to solve those problems in the first place. Uh, I think it's really important that students see that problems really are messy, that there isn't always a nice elegant solution that, um, that can be instantly produce, uh, given to them. Sometimes they do have to struggle what with finding what is the problem and what is the solution. That's absolutely right. And you as a teacher may actually have to model some of that as well. So you may perhaps even have a live session where you show some programming and just make sure that things go wrong and, and you show them how to solve them. So Steve, um, I, I actually sat in one of your classes a couple of years uh, back and I know that you're doing a, a really good job in motivating students of why they need to do things. Now, with your face-to-face -face meetings, how do you think will we be able to motivate our students to engage with the material? So I, th I think that's not just a problem that's related to teaching online. It's it's a challenge trying to motivate students towards statistics and econometrics, even though it probably shouldn't be. Econometrics is a very exciting area of economics, simply because we can, produ we can produce evidence and we can try and pose interesting and challenging empirical problems to students. We can start off with big questions. We can, we can show how, even with relatively straightforward um, uh, steps, we can, we can try and answer some very big problems. So, for instance, you and I spoke before the session that both of us have started, even before students have seen any econometrics, 
talking about Carden Kruger's minimum wage problem and trying to present this as a way of applying um, econometric methods without necessarily understanding any econometrics, but giving it as a as a motivational problem, something that interests the students. Similarly, we could give students um, studies to replicate. So I know that in some of my teaching, I've um, given da uh, students data based on um, free economics in the past to try and replicate or even to try and go beyond the initial replication of uh, Steve Levitt's research. Similarly, within the teaching, it's important to try and get students engaged. So I use uh, message boards um, to try and make sure that students are asking and answering questions. There is some evidence that students benefit if they are actively asking and answering questions within those message boards to gain a stronger understanding of the material. Similarly, it's, it's useful, I think, to try and link the, um, link the empirics that we see with um, topical and related stories. So at the beginning of this term, I was trying to teach um, Bayes' rule as some introductory probability statistics, and I was using some examples using um, tests for HIV. Now, this was just before the um, testing for COVID-19 started kicking off and um, students started coming to me afterwards and saying, well, how do we apply this problem to the um, tests for coronavirus? I, I think you're absolutely right. As the, these new challenges which we are facing the, these days, which are also throwing up huge amounts of data, are really a great opportunity uh, opportunity for us and we really need to uh, to grasp these opportunities so we hope that th this conversation has given you some um, initial points to guide you through how we think about changing our teaching and our students learning opportunities in these difficult times on this particular page we hope that you will find some more detailed resources which elaborate on some of these points <laughs>